Well, good afternoon. Everybody full like me? It's a lot harder than it uh, appears sometimes. I know uh, many of us understand that. But um, so in kind of continuation for this morning, obviously there are lots of those that didn't really want to find out what it meant to have a more abundant life. <laughs> as I expected. Uh, one day I just want them to prove me wrong, though. You know what I mean? That would kind of be nice. But uh, anyways, uh, I said that hoping maybe people would at least be encouraged this morning to stay around this afternoon. I don't know that I'm going to tell you this afternoon anything that you don't already know. Uh, there was no some great mystery that I'm going to reveal to you that you probably haven't heard before uh, by Brother Sam, Brother Josh, or maybe another minister throughout your life. But I want us to kind of step back and really think about something that, Brother, that, that Jesus said here, and that is what it really meant when he said, I have come into this world that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly, that you would have it, life, more abundantly. Uh, I think this world has given a has done a very good job of trying to tell you and I what it means to have an abundant life. Uh, I think they, I mean, they have done a great job. They, do, they, they talk about it in schools. You know, it's almost like you're preconditioned of what you have to do in order to have life, in order to have a good life. And I want you to know that uh, there are those out there that may not have had my experience. They, they, each of us have different experiences. But I can tell you from the from my youth, it was almost I was preconditioned. You had to, you had to go to school, you had to go to college, and then you had to get a job after college, and then you had to do X in order to do this, in order to get to this place, to get to that point in your life, and this, that, and the other. And all the while, they're telling you you're having to do this. When they're like, I look back on it now, I'm like, I could have taken multiple avenues. And I think I would have been equally as happy as long as I was in the presence of my God, serving him, raising my family up in, in, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I could have been very happy. Uh, yes, I have a job. But if for some reason, I mean, many of you knew, know this recently, and I appreciate your prayers, I could have lost my job. And the question always comes is what, you know, what would have happened? What would I have done? I don't know. I know the Lord, I, I have faith in God. And somebody say, well, this is the trying of your faith. No, my faith is every much in God, okay? In other words, if that means I'm unemployed a while, my faith is still in God, that he's going to find a place or find something for me to do. Maybe it's a church. I don't know. Maybe, to, I'd, maybe it's a door open for me to go move somewhere and pastor somewhere. I don't know, but I know God can carry me through it because it's not my way. It's his way. Amen. See, in the Proverbs, it would tell us there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Brother Silas Ford was with us in April at uh, Zion Rest. Uh, me and him were preaching a meeting over there, and he preached a sermon called My Way. And he talked about uh, the old Frank Sinatra song called My Way. I did it my way. And if you ever read the song, actually about two, a week, actually earlier this week, I decided after five, four months, however long it's been since April, I said, I was like, you know what, I want to get that song out, I want to read it. And after really reading it, you can tell, yeah, I did it my way. I mean, you can, and, and he did. And, for, and, and if, if that song is absolutely 100% true, I'll tell you to this day, Frank can have that song because I don't want to do it my way. I know where my way carries me. I've been, in, I've been in ditches, not physically. I'm talking about figuratively. I'm saying I have been in some very low spots in my life, and I want to thank God because He's carried me through each and every one of those spots, those rough patches in my life, and he can carry you through those rough patches, but it's not about my way, it's about his way. Now, something, some people that have any, you know, that sometimes they, people like to be very, I'll say it this way, it's kind of smart aleckly, or, or smart aleck in kind of nature, I hate to say it that way, but, well, just what's God's way? Come on, folks, you know what God's way is. It's in this book. We talked about it today. That we might be able to prove what is that perfect and acceptable will of God. That we make our bodies a living sacrifice. That we would re transform ourselves by the renewing of our mind daily. That we would prove what is that perfect, perfect and acceptable will of God. That is what he's wanting us to do is to make the living sacrifice to him. So here he's telling us in John 10, The thief cometh but to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you would have it more abundantly how do you have a more abundant life you start beginning to learn and uh, uh what jesus would have us to do in his life in, in in our lives 
What would Jesus want? We used to, I mean, I love those old bracelets. What would Jesus do? It never made me do what Jesus wanted me to do. A bracelet's not going to help me do what Jesus wants me to do. Knowing his word will help me do what Jesus wants me to do. You've got to know the word. If I wanted to, you know, I, th- I think about my, my son Levi and my, and my wife Sandy. And I put a lot of pressure on me, but the, I, the, the, the responsibility of love in the family, according to Ephesians 5, rests upon the father. It rests upon, upon the husband in, in, the, in the marriage and on the father of the family. And I have to make sure that I, you know, I'm cognizant of this as I go through life, that I'm taking the time to teach my son. This week, I had to spank my, my for the first time, I had to start getting him. He's starting to grab my electrical cords, and I don't know why, but it's, it's neat and interesting, so he wants it. And I have to start doing that, and I have to tell him no. And you know what I did? He did after I said, he, I, I hit it, you know, like that. And I look at him, I say, no. He goes, <laughs> he does it again. And I'll tell you, you know, it's patience on, on a dad. For me, I'm learning. And people, you know, all you dads out there, it is different. It's different when it is your own experience and it is your child. You can sit there and say, oh, I can do that. Oh, it hurts. It hurt. It's not a hurt. You know, it's, it's weird. It's different. It's, it's new. And I'm learning about it. But the responsibility but you know, it, uh, of that is on the Father. But where do I get that? I get it in the Word of God. What does the world teach us to do? What does Satan do to us? How does Satan teach us? How does Satan deceive us in our lives? Well, it's their fault. It's their fault. It's all them. It's not on me. It's not, on, it's not in my power, in my control. It's, it's that personal. What's the first lie that Satan said? Well, Satan said, oh, if you eat of the fruit, you won't die. You'll become gods. He, God doesn't want you to become like him. And then what does is, what is Adam end up doing? Well, I didn't sin, Lord. It was that woman you gave me. It's always we pass the blame on everybody else. And when things go wrong, we blame everything and everybody else around us. It's all these other circumstances. You know, it's, you know if, if things aren't going life, it's, well, it's, it's my boss's fault. Or, it's, or I, I, I don't get paid. It's always something else. We never take the time to examine ourselves. Brother, and I'm, I'm actually very thankful God put that message on Brother Sam's heart this morning. I beseech you, therefore, uh, brethren, that you make your bodies... Take a look at yourself and ask yourself, if I don't have an abundant life, am I choosing my way or am I choosing God's way? Examine yourself. Are you making yourself a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which according to the scripture, it's reasonable for us to do those things. I have come that you would have life more abundantly. It's amazing to me when I sit and pause and I think about the way the world teaches about things and then I have to slowly pause and think, but what does God's word say about those things? Well, when the world tries to tell you that you need to live a certain way, you need to experience everything, you've heard me say this before and and I'll probably end up preaching this for a lifetime, but the story goes as I was told once that everyone has to go up fool's hill. In other words, you have to go up and make a real big screw up in your life and go up fool's hill because you need the experience. Everybody's got to go up fool's hill. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to. Solomon forced himself to go up fool's hill. Solomon wanted to experience everything under the sun. Why? Why? Solomon himself wanted to try his best to prove almost God's commandments wrong. In other words, if you drink this alcohol, you won't get drunk. In other words, I'm going to see if I can drink it and not get drunk and see what happens. What do you think happened? He got drunk, right? I'm going to see if I can maybe go around and do all these things just to see if they won't happen to me. Okay? And you know what? They did happen to him. And he spends the entire book of Ecclesiastes explaining all of his experiences or most of his experiences to come to one grand conclusion at the end of it. Fear God and keep his commandments. Let's hear the whole conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Amen. So for you and I today, our job, is, our goal is if we want to have a more abundant life, we've got to start taking heed to the word of God. 
We've got to start paying more attention to it. Uh, you know, I was, I was telling a story recently. I don't think I've told this story here. I'll share it with you. But some lady came up to me after one of my sermons somewhere off when I was away and told me, Brother Derek, I hear what you're saying about those people uh, that are uh, part of the LGBT community. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I, I have nothing for them, and I, 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 can't, I, don't, I can't be nice to them. I can't talk to them. I don't want to do anything. I, I can't do that. I, and my message was this. I understand they may be sinners. We're still to love them for Christ's sake. Okay? If somebody in this church is a sinner and we ended up having to address that particular sin, I hope you would do it with love and not discipline, not malice in your heart. Because our goal is to be loving. God's example for us is to be loving and charitable and merciful, merciful to God's children, to, other, to, to, to sinners that we interact with. And this dear sister, I love her, and I, and, and I said, well, I'm going to pray for you on that because God's commandment tells us to love our enemies. It does. Go to the Sermon on the Mount. I, I, I'm not going to read anything over there specifically. I'm just going to give you some hints. Over in the Sermon on the Mount, one of the great, we, we, we talk about it all the time in Matthew chapter 5 and 6 and parts of 7. But he talk, but Jesus over there talks about murder. He talks about adultery. He talks about divorce. He talks about oaths. He talks about retaliation. He talks about things like, you have heard it been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He says, but I have come unto you to teach a new message. And the message was for you and I to turn the other cheek. He says, love, you have heard it been, has been said, verse 43, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Love them. What different teaching Jesus came. And, and it's so different for us because I think the church, not this church, I'm just saying Christians alike have gotten themselves to a place where they, like I, sp I spoke about this morning, a place of judgment. This is not a house of judgment. This is a house of worship. Okay? This is a house of worship. We didn't come in here to sit here and point out people that weren't doing things in, that weren't doing things right, the things that they needed to do better, and making people feel bad about themselves. I hope we came here together under the same banner of love to worship today. Amen. We didn't go, and, and maybe I'm nitpicking, but you want to have another, a, a more abundant life. Try rephrasing the way we say some things. You didn't come to church today. The church gathered to worship today. There's a huge difference. I didn't go churching today. today I'm not churching it right now. It's bad English, by the way, also. <laughs> we didn't, well, we're worshiping together. The reason I want you to interact and the reason I want you to be like energetic while you're here, sing and enjoy the singing. It's okay to say amen after a song. I hear some of us do it every now and then. Because I, but that's something you need to do. If you enjoy it, enjoy it. Worship is something that you're supposed to enjoy. Over in uh, Corinthians, uh, one of the last things uh, that Paul said in Second Corinthians, uh, no, excuse me, Romans fit. I'm going to mess this up. Romans 15. Romans 15, and verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We are to abound in that power. We're to abound, and I'm not saying lift ourselves up in a negative way. We're not lifting ourselves up. We're lifting God up. That's why we gather here together, is to lift God up. I, sometimes I wonder when people come to, to come to worship, and they come in and they're, they look sad, and I don't understand that. I don't know how you can worship and be sad. I want to worship and be glad. I want you to have jo joy. I want you to have hope. I want you to have it in the power of the Holy Ghost. And if you want to, have, if you if you want to have a more abundant life, that is simply the best. The summer to summarize it is this: eternal life is an. Uh, here's what eternal life is. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it to you quickly. Eternal life is an eternity of fellowship in the presence of God. Amen. When Jesus Christ was here on earth, his desire is that we would have life and that we would have it more abundantly, not when we get there, as Brother Sam mentioned this morning, but while we have it 
right now. He wanted us to have it right now. How do you have that now? You have to fellowship with God. You have to fellowship in his presence. And when the saints are gathered together, I hope every time we gather together, he's in our presence. And we ought to be excited that we're in the presence of God. Because why? It's very special to be in the presence of God. You turn over to some other ways that we might would have a more abundant life. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Not only do you need to take heed to the word of God in the aspect of knowing what it's teaching. In other words, knowing and having greater fellowship in the knowledge of his word so that we understand that we don't do things in a negative way. We do it God's way, such as loving your enemies. It's a foreign concept to us. But if we would love our enemies, the Bible says it would heat coals of fire upon their head if we love them. And you know what? I have found in my experience, it's a whole lot easier to love than it is to hate. Amen. When, I, when, I, when I get mad about something, I am mad for days. I'm being honest with you. I'm not trying to be weird up here. I'm just saying... When I get mad about something, I can get mad about it. But when I love my wife and she loves me, it's easy. We just hug each other. We smile. I, I want to cook more often. I want to help with the dishes more often. I do stuff because I just, as I love her. But when I hate, oh, goodness, I don't want to, mm, Don't talk to me. I don't want to, you know, it's, it's so much better. It's so much easier to love. It takes a lot of work to hate because you'll, you'll sit there and you'll, you'll sit there and just let it stew in your mind. When you're loving, you're just kind of freely going. When you're hate, you're letting it stew. You're like, don't say anything to me. Don't do this to me. Don't, you know, whatever. Whatever goes on in your head when you're angry about something. Learn what God said you because he says his way is better. Also, with that, we need to come together to worship. Come together to worship. It's not, we're not coming to church. We try to retrain your mind to say, I'm going to worship today. I get the opportunity today on Sunday to go worship. I'm going to worship. That's action. Church, I'm going to church means you're going to a place. If you say I'm going to worship, that's an action. You're going to do something. You're going to participate in something. And I hope you're participating now. Your expressions on your face is a participating portion of the worship service that Brother Sam... Brother Josh, myself, and any other elder that comes up here and stands in this pulpit, we greatly appreciate. We appreciate your amens. It's okay to say those things. It's okay to laugh and to smile and to cry if you feel emotional. It's okay to do all those things. Because we're, it's, it's all in an effort to glorify God. If His Word touches your heart in a special way, it's okay to cry. It's okay. It's okay to smile. It's okay to laugh. God, did you know God laughs? Sometimes he laughs at us. I'm not going to go all the scriptures this morning that show where he laughs at us, but he does. It's okay. But one of the greatest things over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is, you have the Macedonians here, and it's a very interesting situation. The world today teaches you that you must have all these things. In order to be something... You've got to be able to have money. You've got to be able to have material possessions. You've got to have, there's a status out there that you must ob uh, obtain to get to. In other words, I mean, I can remember going, I'm just going to say it. I remember going to high school. If you didn't wear Abercrombie back in 03 and 04, if you didn't have the Birkenstocks, no, we like the clog ones, not the sandal ones. You had to have the, it was all an image that you had to have. You had to dress a certain way. It, you, it wasn't cool. You know, just when I thought everybody, like, for example, I think back then Mustangs, Mustangs have always been popular, but especially my high school, my senior year, Mustangs were popular. Until one guy shows up in a Porsche. And I don't know who buys their 17-year-old a Porsche, but that happened. <laughs> and that became the new status So. Everybody who had the Mustang was just kind of like, all of a sudden they were happy, all of a sudden they see the Porsche and they're like, oh. That's what happens. I mean, we, we, have the, we compare ourselves. We compare ourselves. 
And I'm here to tell you that the Macedonians were rich in this text that I'm about to read. They didn't have much. They didn't have any. They were very poor. In fact, they were in poverty. Yet when Paul and the disciples came to him, let's read the story. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God. We want to make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty. In other words, they were imploring us with urgency. They were, they were urgent to us that we would receive a gift and take it upon us the fellowship of the ministry of the saints. They were in great poverty, yet they wanted to bestow a gift on the apostles. We sometimes, like I visited a church recently, and they said, we can't keep the doors open. We can only... We, we, We're gonna, we have to run the church a little bit like a business because uh, if you're not bringing money in, then uh, you, you can't have preachers and this, that, and the other. And, you know, that's, you know, when the money runs out, we shut the doors of the church. You have to run the church like a business. And that never sat well with me because they only met twice a month. I said, you know how businesses stay in business, don't you? And she said, no. I said, they're open more often. And... And, and I said, and she just kind of looked at me funny, and I said, I said, I'm not trying to be rude to you, sister. I said, it's just the truth. I said, if you open the doors of the church, if you allow the church to get together more often for ship fellowship opportunities, the church will thrive. But when we get to a point where we think we can do nothing for somebody else because of our current state, we could do the last thing that we have. Turn over with me, real, and hold your finger there if you want to. Mark chapter 12, verse. 44, 40, uh, 41. And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, or truly I say to you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast in into the treasury. For all they did cast into their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all of her little. Sometimes our skewed view of abundance keeps us from recognizing that we are already in great abundance. I was at my parents' house yesterday, and I was sitting on the back porch, and Levi was sleeping on me, and I was just looking around, and I saw the decorative brick on the outside of my parents' house. And then I slowly began to think about all the houses over in Kenya and different parts of the world. Even when I went down to the Bahamas, a place where hurricanes come in through, just come through all the time, and how just, uh, you know, they were, they're very thankful that they have four walls up around them, whether it be made out of mud or of something else, or even just, uh, what are they, cinder blocks or whatever they can get their hands on, or just rock in general that's got some sort of sealant or mud in it that is able to give them a home, and yet I'm sitting there looking at the brick, maybe the nice brick on the outside of this house, and I'm sitting there thinking, we probably sit here and say to ourselves, why don't we have more people at the church? Why don't we have bigger this? Or why don't we have this? We, we already have so much. We compare ourselves with things like numbers, how many people are in attendance. I'm very thankful that there's only a few here today. Why this afternoon? Why? Because you obviously really wanted to learn or hear about something that was from God's Word. That makes you very abundant. You have it already in abundance. The poor people that are described here in the, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the eighth chapter of the book of 2 Corinthians, they were urging the ministers of the, of the of, and I'm not encouraging you to give things to me, Brother Sam, Brother Josh, not saying that. I'm saying they were so gracious that they would come and preach the gospel to them. 
they did everything they can to the point of begging them and imploring them to take maybe whatever gift they had to offer them. And it may have been the last things that they had because they were in deep poverty. But Paul describes them as rich. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desire Titus that he... That, he, um, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and in knowledge and all diligence and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich. The example for you and I was not to focus on material possessions. Jesus Christ himself, the man, the living son of God, came down and made himself of no reputation, yet would freely be able to say, the birds of the air have their nests, the, uh, the, um, the foxes have their holes, the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man hath no place to lay his head. So what is an abundant life? It's obviously not what we think it is or what the world tells us it is. They used, to t- they used to say this a lot, and for you younger folks here, I don't know if they say this anymore, but they used to tell us, you need a reality check. I tell you, we need a gospel reality check. The world is out there teaching today that if you just give enough money to the church, somehow you're just going to be ki- healed of all your sickness. Somehow you're just going to be able to pay for all this. And we've heard the stories about uh, you know, people just giving their entire life savings and donating to the church. The preacher who wanted a $59 million uh, jet, so thankful Brother Sam got his jet over here that he told me about. And uh, it's a little bitty figurine, by the way, if somebody's listening to this later. Uh, and uh, But that's what they're teaching is that they're out there saying that this is the abundant life God wants you to have. And the answer is, no, it is not. God said, do my will. If you are my, if you are my disciple, it says, if you will keep my commandments, then, only then, are you my disciples indeed. So if you want to know how to have a life that's more abundant, we're going to have to begin by doing the will of God. We're going to have to start looking into his word and figuring what it means to how to teach people. I mean, how to, how, to, how to act towards others, excuse me. The last thing I'll leave you is over in Matthew, 8, uh, Matthew 11. Kind of wrapping up and getting back to the beginning. The thief cometh but to steal and to kill and to destroy. Just prior to that, Jesus himself would say, I am the door of the sheep. And only by me are my sheep able to come in and out and find pasture. And while they're in my pasture, the thieves and the robbers, they came, but the sheep didn't hear them. I tell you, if we want to have a more abundant life, we're going to have to find a way to have more fellowship with God. We're going to have to to come here every Sunday ready to worship God. And when we leave this place, we need to take the worship of God and take it right back home to our family. And teaching our, our loved ones, teaching our wives. It's the way we talk to each other. It's the way we act toward each other. Because <coughs> I'm convinced that my son, and if the Lord so blesses my future children, will only learn how to love others the way me and my wife love each other. In Matthew 11, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Something we know very well. But more importantly, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. 
We have to learn what Jesus wanted us to do. He, we have to learn how Jesus wanted us to act. That Sermon on the Mount, not only did he talk about some of the things, he talked about how we ought to give. He talked about prayer. He talked about fasting. He talked about wealth. He talked about, you know, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure at? Where do you put stock in? What do you put your stock in? Not, and I'm not talking about the stock portfolios. I'm not talking about money and finances. I'm saying, where does you reside most of the time as far as where you spend your time, where do you spend your energy, where do you focus your mind on all the time? Because whatever it is, that's your treasure. Amen. And Jesus says, and if that's your treasure, your heart's over there too. Now, obviously, Jesus would want us to know that if our treasure were, were in him, if we would treasure him, there our heart would be also. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All the examples where, like in Matthew chapter 8, where the sea is still, where he calms the sea, he constantly wanted to show his disciples through his ministry, throughout the Gospels, we constantly see the power of God. And once, you know, and that's why I started off this morning. Do you believe that there is a God? It's so important. Otherwise, we get to thinking these are fictitious stories that Jesus walked on water. That Jesus would heal the blind. That just by the touch, somebody touching his garment, he actually felt his glory go out of him to heal the woman. Do you actually believe these accounts that are recorded for us? I wonder sometimes if we believe more in Satan than we do in Jesus Christ. Because if we did believe more in Jesus Christ, we wouldn't get down so easily at the attacks of Satan. Amen. How do you have a more abundant life? We have to learn of our God and who he is, who we, who we are standing by. Me and Brother, Brother Josh were singing a song before we started. We sing it wrong, but I like the song. And it says, you know, uh, it's 447 in the hymn book. It's, uh, when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. You read that in so many, thou who knowest all about it, stand by me. All the, the, if you read the words of that, that, that song, that is a song of each and every one of us throughout life. We're going to have storms, and they're going to rage. We're going to have our ups and we're going to have our downs. But Jesus Christ himself said to stand by me. In other words, we need to come unto him and learn of him. Learn who can actually protect us from the thief and the robber that is coming to steal our joy. That may get to the point where he wants to kill us or we may get thoughts of suicide. But he wants to destroy every single ounce of every little church family, place, or thing that gives any glory to God. That's his goal. And if we want an abundant life, and if we want to combat Satan and the thief, he says, just come abide with me. Just come spend a little time with me and learn of him. He says, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul, souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's many things that I could probably go to. I haven't probably even scratched the surface of how to have a more abundant life. But our abundance is not in the abundance that the world teaches us. If I were to lose my job, I know God would have taken care of me, but I still thank you for your prayers. I really do. And there are other circumstances that I could talk about. Sometimes we, uh, I know we lose loved ones. I know we have things that overwhelm us sometimes. Things that we weren't prepared for. And I think a lot about Brother Sam 
because over the last few weeks he's had this sickness come back over him. And I would say, Brother Sam has two choices. He can either let the sickness get him down to the point where he's angry at God, or he can get down on his knees and pray to the God and fellowship with him. Now, which is easier, Brother Sam? And I imagine the, the praying with God and asking him to help gives him a whole lot more comfort than it does to get, to get mad and angry and down about it. But see, that's the, way the, that's the way sin works in this world is we are immediately drawn to think, again, we have the complete 180 opposite view of what abundance is in this world. They could take my house, they could take my car, they could take everything away. But you know what? I'm not going to have it in glory anyway. Ever think about stuff like that? We can't take it with us, folks. We can't take it with us. But yet we spend a lifetime obtaining and obtaining and obtaining. I love my mother. And don't, if she hears this, I'm in trouble. She loves pictures. And I'm telling you, some of y'all may know what I'm talking about, how she loves pictures. Not a single one of those pictures is she going to be able to take with her in heaven one of these days. But you know what? That's okay. I'm sure it brings her a lot of joy right now. But I think we just have to refocus our minds on what's really important. Me and Sammy have been trying to think about that a lot, about our own decisions right now. I love my little son. We bought a brand new rug. We didn't spend a lot of money on it. Good decision. Because there's nothing like watching that boy just throw up all over that thing. And then me have to clean it up. And you know what? I actually wasn't even, I wasn't even disappointed. I was just like, oh, well, you know, just clean it up and everything. But could you imagine if I had an expensive rug and he would have done that? I would have been the product of my own demise. I shouldn't have bought the expensive rug anyway. It was a cheap rug. It's just changing the way we think, like Brother Sam was talking about this morning. We've got to renew our mind around what God would have us to do. And if we can do that, then our abundant life comes. But until then, the world continues to afflict us, to try to destroy us and tear us down and keep us from having the right kind of joy that we could have when we gather here to worship. Let's be aware of these things because we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. Lord bless us.
that's living, isn't it, to know more about Jesus Christ, our Lord. I think that's what we'll spend eternity doing, so it's blessing down here. It's been a great privilege for me to be with all of you today, and hope you have a great week coming up. Anything else we need to mention? If not, and all minds are content, Brother Mark, would you please dismiss us with prayer?